Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Holly Randall Unfiltered. Before I begin, I want to give a shout out to my sponsors at Blue Chew. If you're looking for more confidence in the bedroom, if stress or anything else in your life has been affecting your performance, then you want to give Blue Chew a try. They come with the same ingredients as Viagra and Cialis for a fraction of the cost. And you can try it for free. Go to bluechew.com, use code Holly, pay only $5 in shipping. Okay, so I want to introduce my guest today. He is an award-winning writer, performer, master fetish trainer, MC, and activist. Throughout his two decades in the industry, he's used his platform to make the sex and porn industry safer and more fulfilling for people of color. Let's welcome King Noir. Peace, peace. Thank you for having me. Of course. Thank you for coming. We've been uh, trying to make this happen for a while, so I'm glad that we finally could. Likewise. Yeah. I have to say, so... Full disclosure, we had a book before I got sick, so we had to reschedule. And because I have a toddler who brings all the germs home, the other day I thought I felt a little like scratch in my throat, and I was like, fuck off. Like, this guy's going (laughs) to fucking hate me. I'm like, there's no way I can cancel this. So I took all the antibiotics, and I'm fine. Oh, and you got that liquid death. And I got the liquid death. Yes. Shout out to liquid death for sending me tons of free water. I appreciate you guys so much. So um, if you guys aren't aware of King. Um, His partner actually was on the show a little while ago, Jet Setting Jasmine, one of my favorite interviews. She's really brilliant. Really interesting conversation about, um, you know, not only the work that she does as a therapist and as a sex worker, but also like about being a parent, about the non-monogamy that you guys share and how, you know, I'd never really realized that that could be something that could be fluid and changeable. Um, And she talked about how, you know, it, you guys would change it and it would ebb and flow depending on what was going on in your lives. And for somebody who's actually in a monogamous relationship and, and very happy in it, I'm always still so curious about non-monogamy. So could you maybe, could we start off by talking a little bit about your family, about your partner and how that works for you? Sure, sure. Just like I said to you uh, earlier, I get to interview uh, Jasmine every day. So she's <laughs> definitely brilliant. Um, I think with non-monogamy, monogamy, any type of relationship that we have, we have to always check in with our partners, our friends, whoever it is, to keep adding on to it, keep building it, repairing some things that might have been, you know, damaged in some sort of way. So there always is going to be this ebb and flow. And it's, it's funny, like, not even just with Jasmine, but I've realized that learning that lesson from my relationship I also do with my friendships. Mm. I also do it, you know, like with my mother. Like I'm checking in with her, trying to just make sure that how can I be a better son or a better friend or a better partner to whoever I'm with. Mm -hmm. And how do you do these check-ins? Like how does that work in real life? I don't have like a checklist or anything like that. It's just one of those. (laughs) It's just one of those things where I realize, like you know, we haven't had a. Like let's say it's it's one of my one of my people's like a friend or something like that. Just checking in, like yo, what's good with you? What you been up to? What's going on in your life? You know what I'm saying? What you need support in? Because most most of the friends I have at this point, they like family to me. Mm-hmm. So it's kind of like how can we work? How can we how can we help each other achieve goals that we got? Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? So that's kind of the, the level of that. Now with a with a partner like with Jasmine, because we do have so many working parts of our relationship, whether it be from the love aspect, the parenting aspect, the sexual aspect that includes other people both on and off camera, that part, that has a checklist for me Mm. because there are certain things I want to make sure like, yo, how you feeling about me doing X, Y, and Z Mm -hmm. in this next shoot? Or how do you feel about like, do you need a break from doing all the the super mom shit right now, Mm -hmm. you know? All that kind of stuff does have a checklist. Mm-hmm. Do you find that, like, like, do you feel out when you need to have these conversations? Or do you try to have it, like, on a schedule? Like, I ask this question because my brother and sister-in-law, I'm actually very jealous of them. They have this thing called Sunday Chat, where every Sunday, every fucking Sunday, the whole, and they've been together for five years now or something, okay. they sit down and they talk to each other about their week and, like, maybe what, they were feeling about certain things, which like for me is so admirable. Like I can't bring myself to do that. I know. Right. Um, So, so how does that work for you? Do you just 
like, do you sense things are changing or like, how do you know when you guys need to have that, that talk? We got some kind of symbiotic relationship okay. going on because <laughs> there are times when we just check in with each other, like, or we'll share like, yo, I just want a day of just me and you, mm-hmm. or I need to get away from the kids for a minute or yeah. whatever, you know, I am for a lot of times it does kind of come natural to us, but if there's been a span of time where we haven't had that or jump, something just seems kind of off key and how one of us are feeling, then do that as well. Mm-hmm. I, I don't know if I'd be able to keep that every Sunday. Schedule. I know. That's, that's church right there. That's I know. I, I know. Really, it really, really is, right? right? <laughs> now, have you, oh, like, how did you get into Nongmanwagadi? Is that something that you felt like you always were better suited for since you were young or was it something that you discovered later on in life? It is something that I have always felt, but I didn't have words for it back in the day. People told me something was wrong with me Mm. for it back in the day. And also partners I've been with have either been like, nah, it's not for me. Or people have told them like, you know, he don't really love you if he's also interested in other people, which Mm -hmm. has kind of led to some relationships where people felt hurt or I completely closed that side of me off and then I wound up being unhappy. Mm -hmm. So it's been a journey to finally be able to be in a relationship with somebody that when we both got into this relationship, we kind of, I said to Jasmine, like, I'm never going to be in a monogamous relationship again because it's just not for me. And she was just like, I don't want a man telling me what to do. I was like, perfect. (laughs) (laughs) Like, we good. (laughs) Pinky swear. (laughs) Like, uh, so for, for our relationship though, Jasmine had not been in a non-monogamous relationship before, and the previous non-monogamous relationship that I was in before, everybody was just kind of feeling things out, Mm -hmm. you know? So we came into this, like, we're going to really work on it. And we've been through ups and downs, and some of it has come from that, but most of it has been the kind of things you deal with in any type of relationship, monogamous, non-monogamous, just two people trying to make it work. Yeah. What do you say to those people who say that, you know, if you can't only have sex with this one person for the rest of your life, then you don't really love them? Like, how do you respond to that? Well, first, for me, polyamory isn't about sex. Mm -hmm. It's actually about getting to know people, building relationships, and loving somebody. Mm -hmm. So... If someone was like the sex aspect, eh, that might be easier for me to do than to not get to know people and love people. Mm -hmm. As for the sexual aspect of things, we're all wired differently. You know, to me, sex doesn't always include love, just like love doesn't always include sex. Mm -hmm. So I don't try to keep it in those kind of boxes. Mm -hmm. And for people who don't understand, I would say like, if you got a a bunch of your friends, you love all your friends differently, or your siblings, you love your siblings differently. It doesn't take away from the love you have for one because you love someone else. Mm-hmm. It's just a different relationship. Yeah. I remember I was taught, I think I was interviewing Tristan Terramino, and she she's also talks a lot about non-monogamy. And she was saying how, you know, often I feel like, especially with relationships, we try to... P- put everything that we need from somebody on one person, which is actually pretty unfair. And usually one person can never fulfill all of our needs, our sexual needs, our emotional needs, our mental stimulation needs, our, um, I don't know, fix my car needs. Like, you know what I mean? Like whatever, like it's like we put all of that on one person. And then of course, when they can't come through with everything, you know, we feel betrayed and hurt when it's just that we're expecting too much from one person. I absolutely agree with that. And I think it's also this kind of fairy tale idea that we can do that for somebody else. Mm -hmm. We can support somebody in all of the things that they do and all of the things that they love and support their goals and dreams, but that doesn't mean we have to walk down every path with them. Yeah. You know, uh, I think that a lot of times, like I, I talk to people who are in relationships with um, some of the kink counseling stuff that we do. And I have one partner who's like, yo, I'm really into, let's just say, rope play. Mm-hmm. The other partner's like, I'm I'm not really interested in learning how to tie shibari and suspend mm-hmm. somebody. Cool. Hire a professional and then do whatever y'all want to do. 
safely mm-hmm. after your partner is, you know, suspended and shabari. You mm-hmm. know, you don't have to go through that whole process to do this specific thing. It's about finding compromises. And or maybe if you're not even interested in seeing it, just establish some ground rules. Like if you're not comfortable with your partner being with somebody else sexually, be like, yo, get all the rope tie and suspension you need. But I'd appreciate it if you didn't step out of our relationship sexually. Mm-hmm. If you can compromise on that, you can compromise on a whole lot. Mm-hmm. And I think I think that works for any kind of relationship. Because if you're if you're monogamous and you do want to do things that your partner isn't into and not specifically regarding sex, you're, you do run into kind of like bumping heads. Like I am very interested in, I don't know, let's just say your partner is a, like a sports head or something mm-hmm. like that. And you just could care less. Mm-hmm. If you're always putting your partner down for enjoying sports, like at a certain point, they'll be like, why do you hate what I'm into? Yeah. Or if you're telling your partner, like, come to me for this shit that you're not interested in, they're going to be there and they're going to be miserable. And you don't mm-hmm. want that either. Yeah. So you have to be willing to allow your partner to grow as their own person just as you need to grow as yourself. Yeah. Do you think that sometimes like the downfall of relationships is this like just insecurity and this need to feel a sense of ownership over people? Yeah, I think. To me, ownership and love have nothing to do with one another. Yeah. You know, love is truly allowing somebody to to flourish and be who their best selves, Mm -hmm. whether they're working towards that or they found that and they living in it. You know, so if you're trying to possess somebody and you're holding that person back, you don't really love. Yeah. So often in my comments, I see men, you know, saying that if you're a real man, you would never let you know, your wife or girlfriend sleep with other people, like that demasculinizes you. Do you, how do you respond to that? Where is this real man handbook that people pull out (laughs) whenever it comes to a woman doing some shit that men want to do? That's the only time I ever really hear this. (laughs) You're not a real man if you do anything that is considered feminine or you're not a real man if you're not controlling of the woman in your life. Like Mm -hmm. I, I don't, I don't believe in any of that. You know, if you feel demasculated when that happens or emasculated, whatever the word is, then you need to take that up with your therapist. Mm. But if no, somebody but, that, else, but that's not manly to go see oh, a therapist. Shit. Then you need to talk Real to men somebody. don't seek therapy. You need to talk to your bartender <laughs> <laughs> after you're about halfway drunk. Halfway <laughs> halfway drunk is when you're allowed to talk to your bartender, I think, in the man book. But um, I think there are so many... So many of these boxes, especially men, have like all these boxes that they feel define what a man is. But when you really ask them to define what a man is, it's always things that anybody could fucking do, Mm. regardless of their gender, orientation, binary, whatever. Mm -hmm. So it's like you don't even have like the idea of your soul spirit, if you believe in that, or... The science aspect of it. It's, it's always kind of like something within society of trying to keep someone else in place. Mm. And if that's all a man is, then fuck that shit. Yeah. Who wants to do that? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, we can we talk about rigid gender roles for women, but we see that for men, too. Yeah. You know, I think we just maybe we don't talk about that. Because it's not manly to talk <laughs> about that. Men, <laughs> and, yo, it's so funny. And it, it, I saw this the whole the whole time, like during the uh, Hillary Trump debates thing. Everybody's yeah. like, you don't want a woman uh, with her hand on the But I'm like, yo, she's way more calm and collective. This dude is emotional. Yeah. And it's like those kind of those kind of stereotypes where it's like these gender roles and, and men are always like, oh, that's that's some female shit. That's. What women get emotional, like, dude, you're emotional explaining to this, this to me right now. Yeah. <laughs> Calm yeah. down. You're emotional about how emotional you think she is. You're getting very emotional about that. Yeah. And, and I think for me, when it comes to my partner being with other people, personally, I love to be there. I love to watch. I love to be a part of it. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? I love to see her pleased, whether it's by me or somebody else. That shit is a turn on. Mm-hmm. You know? So it's funny when we were, when we were first together, I had already been, you know, in a swinger lifestyle, BDSM lifestyle, 
you know, I've been a hoe for years, been in <laughs> porn, like, you know what I'm saying? So like certain things, we, we were at like a swingers party and Jazz was just like very uncomfortable with, with me seeing her with somebody else. Mm -hmm. And I really wanted to see her <laughs> with somebody else. And it was like one of our first times where we, where we, we got into like an argument about it because it was like very much neither one of us was really good at expressing where we were coming from. It was just mm -hmm. like an in the moment kind of thing. And we worked through it. And it was like one of the best conversations we could have because it was just like, oh, no, I wasn't mad at this. I was just like, I really wanted to watch. And she was like, no, I really wasn't mad at you for this. I was just uncomfortable because I've never been in that situation before. Mm -hmm. So it's just kind of like, oh, cool. You know, yeah. Now we make porn together. That's great. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so speaking of porn, um, let's talk about how you actually got into the adult industry in the first place. Oh, man. I got into it at 18 years old. I had a friend who was a dancer, and someone asked her to be in, like, a magazine. That's how, how long ago this was. They were like, we want to shoot you for a magazine. And she was like, I'll do it, but I don't want any random dicks in my face. Mm. So she reached out to me because we have been messing around for whatever. She's like, I know you like being watched and all that shit. Mm -hmm. Like, yo, come come do this. And I got paid. And at the time, I was definitely like couch surfing, sleeping in the park, sleeping on the train. Like I, I, I was homeless at the time. Oh, so wow. it was I was like, oh, shit, I got paid for doing something I love to do that I don't think I'm gonna get arrested for it. Like this is good, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's like, so, you know, that from there the photographer said, Hey, I know this uh producer, this is in Jersey. Um, I know this producer who also connects couples with like he, they didn't want to say escort, mm -hmm. but they they were like with I don't remember, models or something like mm -hmm. that. And it wound up being like cuckolding. Mm-hmm. I had no idea that this shit really existed. Like, it was like literally, like, just, I, right, I'll do it. And then that's where I got introduced to BDSM. That's where I got introduced to people who, they, I mean, I guess they, they were porn producers, but it wasn't like the shit was going out anywhere. It was like people who were paying to have you fuck with like their wife or somebody else and they recorded it. And I guess it was either for their private stash or it's floating out there mm -hmm. in some DVD, not even DVD, on VHS store somewhere. <laughs> you know? so wow. That was, that was like my real introduction to it. Okay. Yeah. And so how did it progress from there? From there, <sighs> dancing, did a lot of stripping, did a lot of dancing, erotic massages, things like that. And then, uh, Jasmine and I met and started doing parties together. Mm -hmm. We did fantasy flight parties. And Phil Verone uh, asked us to be to host one of our fantasy flight parties for a series he was doing for Vivid. Okay. And kind of like went from there. Like some companies were reaching out in Florida. I shot for like Scoreland and uh, what is it? A whole bunch of like Florida stuff mm -hmm. out here as well. And from our parties, people started asking because like primarily our parties were, you know, black and brown couples. And people would say, how come when I watch porn, it's so fucking racist? Mm. Or black folk or, or Spanish folk, we're the fetish instead of engaging in fetishes. Or mm -hmm. it looks low budget in these kind of settings and not intentionally amateur, mm -hmm. just low budget. Mm -hmm. So that's what got us to start Royal Fetish Films mm -hmm. about 10 years ago. Oh, wow. So we were just like, we wanted to show, you know, people of color can be lit well, can be, uh, you know, uh, engaging in all types of fetishes, be passionate, be kinky, and it doesn't particularly have to be from some kind of racist angle. Yeah. Yeah, I definitely want to get into that. Um, so we're going to take a quick commercial break, and then we're going to come back. We're going to talk about more about Royal Fetish Films, um, King's work in uh, kink in general, and so much more. So hang tight. We'll be right back. Yeah. This episode is brought to you by Blue Chew. Erectile dysfunction is a common problem affecting millions of men and causing distress in lots of relationships. It's more than just a physical problem. It can create psychological and emotional issues that can lead to low self-esteem and depression. Fortunately, there is a solution to this problem, thanks to Blue Chew, the revolutionary chewable tablet that has changed how you treat your ED problems. 
Blue Chew is the first chewable tablet that contains the same ingredients that are found in Viagra and Cialis, and it's so easy to get. All you have to do is go to bluechew.com and consult with one of their licensed medical technicians who will prescribe the right dosage just for you. Blue Chew is FDA approved and clinically tested, and thousands of men have already benefited from this revolutionary ED medication. They've regained their confidence and mojo in bed, and so can you. So if you want to bring back your bedroom game, go to bluechew.com and use code HOLLY to try your first dose for free. Just pay $5 in shipping. That's bluechew.com with code HOLLY. You have nothing to lose and everything to gain. Bring back that bedroom game with Blue Chew. All right, everybody, we are back. So yeah, tell us a little bit more about Royal Fetish Films and like exactly what you guys are putting out. Cause you're also, you're making films, but you're also like doing sex toys. You're doing workshops as well too, oh, right? We, we do all the things. So Royal Fetish Films, we, we have been producing our own films uh, for oh yeah about 10 years now. We got a, a, a nice little stack of uh, Fetcon awards. Cause we do, we like to do heavy on presenting different fetishes because mm-hmm. when we got started doing the parties, we always wanted to introduce couples and and single folk to different ways to either find pleasure with their partner or pleasure for themselves and just, you know, always expand. Like sex is something that can always expand. You can add, always add something new to your pleasure, mm-hmm. which also led to us having our own toys. So I have a, a dildo mold through Lust Arts, and Jasmine has her own line of insertables through Lust Arts as well. So they vary in intensity, density, you know, texture, and all of that. We have our own edging bands, which is like kind of like a cock ring. They got nice little messages on them and stuff like that. And I will have a package sent out to you as well. So you can enjoy with your partner Mm -hmm. or solo. and then also we have our own line of impact instruments, so floggers and straps and all kinds of fun things. Too. Right. Yeah. Do you have a favorite fetish yourself? If I had to say one, I am definitely an exhibitionist. Mm-hmm. You know, like in all aspects of exhibition. Like I'm a musician also, so I love being on stage. I love being watched sexually, sharing it, all that good shit. Mm-hmm. That's that's definitely my number one. Mm-hmm. Um, and then do you guys do workshops? Is that We do. We we do a bunch of different workshops. Uh, teach people about impact play, like some one-on-one stuff. But also we have been developing a workshop on the decolonization of sex. Mm. And we also do one on sex positive parenting. Okay. Yeah, that's that's because you say you have a, a you have a toddler as well. I sure do. So we have we have the whole spectrum. We have a just turned one year old, a about to turn five year old, or about about to turn nineteen year old, and a twenty two year old who's about to get married. So we have like the full, wow, the full gambit of life. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so it's it's like one of those things where we would get a lot of questions from parents who are like, you know, either looking to rekindle they flame since they've been you know parenting hard, or people who are concerned about raising their children in a in a way for them to be safe mm-hmm. and then also raising their children in a way that they won't you know get in their way as they grow up in in a world that's got a whole lot going on right now. Yeah. I mean, what do you have like one tip that you could give, you know, sex worker parents in terms of sex positive parenting because I know that there are yeah. There's a lot of concern about how do you tell your kids what you do for a living? You know, how do you stop them from being bullied in school? You know, like all the shame and stigma that surrounds the adult industry. I wish there was just one thing I could say, but <laughs> it, there's there's a couple. I think first and foremost, and this goes for any parent, there is no birds and the bees talk. There's no one talk. It's mm-hmm. a constant conversation that you have to have with your mm-hmm. kids because how you talk to your Toddler is not going to be how you talk to your 20-year-old. Mm-hmm. So keep that open conversation and always keep your mind open, you know, and don't force how you feel about something on your kids. Yeah. As for my fellow sex workers, I think everything age appropriate, mm-hmm. you know. So, like, my four-year-old, he knows that daddy's going to be on a podcast and daddy, daddy works in movies, mm-hmm. you know. 
and as, as an artist. You know, I, I keep it like that. And mm -hmm. all of us know how, whether talkative or inquisitive our kids are. So we might have to give a little bit of a different answer, but we don't have to give the, well, I do all, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. because the kid don't understand at that age. Right. Uh, for kids who are older, you know, like our older kids, we got them all blocked on all forms of social media. <laughs> you know, they have us blocked on all forms of social media. But we do tell them still age appropriately because, you know, like our 22-year-old is at the age where, you know, they going to jump on and look whatever she looking for mm -hmm. on the internet. Mm -hmm. And you might come across us. So mm -hmm. we have to say, like, you know, I will stay away from this site. You know, I will stay away from this site. Mm -hmm. We're not on this site. Mm -hmm. You know, like something like that. Um, and then when she did deal with, she did actually deal with some bullying in high school. And she's a G though, because she, she knew like for one, when kids would say something, she would say something to the effect of like, you're not old enough to be on that site. Why would you know that? Mm -hmm. And if, and, but the weirder thing was parents who tried to have conversations with her. Oh, that's and she handled that smooth as well because she was just like, uh, "That's not a conversation I should have with an adult." If you would like, I can call my parents for you right now. Mm -hmm. You know, um, but not all of our kids are going to react, you know, as as calmly as she did. So I would say, still age appropriate conversation, but let them know that what mommy or daddy does is consensual, is safe, and not harmful. Mm -hmm. And that you love your child and you work how you work. And this is how we survive. This is how they get to enjoy, you know, whatever fruits of your labor are 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 given to them. But it's tough because right now things are changing a lot. You know, um, depending on what state you live in, you know, like Louisiana just passed that law uh, about kind of like they're collecting people's IDs who even go to adult sites. So I don't know what backlash also comes to sex workers based mm -hmm. on the laws that they're setting up in certain states. So I would try to make sure that your child also knows not to go into detail about what they know about mm -hmm. your work with other people, just because that can be misconstrued in a whole lot of ways as well. Yeah. So, I mean, speaking from my own personal experience, my parents weren't in porn themselves, but they did, you know, direct it. And, um, when I was young, they just say, you know, mommy and daddy make movies for grownups. That yep. was the extent of my understanding. And I was like, okay, you know, for grownups, that's, I'm not a grown up. And then as I got older, I don't like remember them specifically, you know, sitting me down and telling me, but it was just something I think they were just not ever dishonest about. And I just kind of knew about it. And also like they didn't make it a big deal, right? Yeah. Because we, we, we mirror our parents. So if our parents like make it this big secret that we, they hide from you and then, you know, like then it is a big deal. But I, I feel like my mom was always like the naked body is beautiful and natural and yeah. like nothing to be ashamed of. So I never felt that it was. And like, you know, I, I mean, my parents were swingers. They used to go to orgies. My mom didn't do nude modeling. She shot herself for hustler and for playboy. And like, I've seen all of those pictures, you know, <laughs> I found like a picture recently. I, when I was going through my father's, my, all my parents' pictures, when he died, I found a picture oh, of my dad at an orgy. <laughs> and I like, I just, it doesn't bother me at all. Like it just like, and my siblings too, like we just laugh about it. We're like, oh, that's mom and dad. So yeah. I don't live, know. They live their life. You yeah. Know, I think. This is something I tell people too. No matter what your job is, up to about a certain age, your kids could care less. But yes. They really don't give a they fuck. No matter care. what you do. Yeah. You uh <laughs> even if you're the president of the United States, I'm sure at a certain point your kid is just like, ah, oh, you're always in my way <laughs> making yeah. laws and shit. But I, I think it's it's mostly like the, your kids are are concerned about are they getting their toys? Are they mm -hmm. getting their food? Are they safe? do you love them? Yeah. You know, and, and not particularly in that order. They probably care if you love them first, but yeah. you know, all, all of that, that's what matters to them. Mm -hmm. And I, I totally agree with how your parents rock with it. It's not something that needs to be a secret, but it's also like your kids are only going to ask those questions to a certain extent, mm -hmm. you know, like, especially like our, our oldest two, our second oldest daughter, 
she used to just love like, oh, can I put something on your Amazon list? Because I would just get all these packages from fans from Amazon. Mm -hmm. So it was like, why are you getting all these packages? Oh, because my fans will buy it off my list. Mm -hmm. Can you put these lights? That she like wanted to put the lights around her room. Mm -hmm. Can you put these lights on your list? Yeah, yeah sure. We'll see what happens. Mm -hmm. I'll just buy it. Yeah. <laughs> but like, other than that, she don't never, ever, ever want to know. Yeah. Any other work. But it was just like, how can this benefit me? That's what I want to know. <laughs> right. You know, so I, I think like on that kind of extent, like the, we don't have to try to have like this whole kind of conversation. And also if you feel what you're doing is right, if what you're feeling is and, and what we do is for adults, you don't really have to have a whole kind of breakdown with mm -hmm. your kids about it. The point where I usually get in the conversations about porn with with our porn and parenting talks is parents who are trying to make sure their kids don't get find porn on like their their devices or mm -hmm. you know some of these games that you play, you know, you click one thing and it takes you to a whole nother place like mm -hmm. how can they avoid those kind of things? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um so I wanted to ask you about racism in porn. Because I know that you've been very, very outspoken about it. Um, can you tell me maybe about when you first started to encounter that in your own work? And, you know, I know that part of the reason that you started Royal Fetish Films was to show black and brown people in a different light. So maybe talk yeah. about your journey <clears throat> there. Well, the first time I ever encountered racism in porn was, was when I was searching through my father's porn stash. Mm. And so my mother's African-American, my father's Italian and German-American. Mm -hmm. And he had this, this magazine, they weren't, they weren't together. He had this magazine where it was literally dudes dressed up like Klan members and a black woman who had an Afro just like my mother. And that shit was like the craziest fucking shit. Like even to this day, I'm like amazed that that was anywhere. That was and in a magazine? Was, it was in a magazine. This do you was, remember what the magazine was? Was it an American I, magazine? I do not. I, I do not. But this was like, I don't know, the 80s. Yeah, so that's crazy, though. It definitely turned me off from porn from when I was younger. So I wasn't really like a seeking out porn after that. Yeah. So um, within the industry, from the beginning, when I first started doing cuckolding stuff, people would want to you know, racialize everything. Yeah. And I'm not about that. Like, there's yeah. my, my mother definitely raised me like, nah, you don't take that shit from nobody. So I'm like, yeah, I'll completely fuck your wife, but you're not going to use that word for me. Mm -hmm. You know? So it's kind of been there and was definitely uncomfortable for me from some of the initial uh, scenes that people would reach out to me for, like, you know, there's certain companies that shoot like prison scenes. And I'm like, why everybody black gotta be in a prison scene? Mm -hmm. That doesn't really, that don't work for me. Yeah. Prison isn't sexy. Yeah. Right? Or titles of films that I might be in and then they throw the title on later. And it's like something that you just be like, why, who the fuck even yeah. <laughs> thinks that's a good idea? Yeah. Uh, so, you know, like the whole Queen of Spades movement and things like that, where it's just like, this is racist as fuck. Mm -hmm. So. Can you talk a little bit about that? Like, oh, clarify yeah. that for my listeners? All right. So. Because I did, I remember I watched an exchange on Twitter with you, um, and it was something that I didn't know about. All right. So there's like a whole, I, I don't know what it would be, like a subculture mm -hmm. uh, of white women who will get. QOS, a black spade tattooed on their bodies where they, some have a husband who they might be cuckolding or the husband is just turned on by the idea that their wife primarily or only fucks black men. Mm -hmm. and, and this would be a white husband? Yeah, he's okay, just yeah. a white husband. I'm, I mean, usually. Yes. Yeah. But, um, I'm sure there are also some that are married to black men and all this stuff. But it's it's like completely rooted in the idea that one of the filthiest things a white woman can do is have sex with a black man. Mm -hmm. You have sex with a man, period. Yeah. <laughs> like somebody's skin doesn't somehow now make them filthy. Mm -hmm. So like the idea of like even using a queen of spades, spade is a racial epithet. Mm -hmm. And... It's not the N-word, but it's definitely a racial epithet. Mm -hmm. So 
but it's one of those that can kind of move. I guess people think it sounds cool. I don't know. But to me, fetishizing a race removes the humanity from the people within it. Yeah. So that was kind of what led to that that conversation on uh, on it. Now, to understand racial fetishization in America, you have to go back to almost everything. Everything in America pretty much goes back to slavery. The reason right. America is as rich as it is is because it was built on the backs of slaves. Mm -hmm. The number one uh, product in America was slaves. So in order to make sure that this worked after you know international slave trade was banned, in order to reproduce and, and build up slaves here in America, one of the primary things that was had was slave plantations. Slave plantations and breeding plantations in Virginia. Virginia was one of the most, was was the place where that was, that was the, the number one product. So some of our signers of the Declaration of Independence and presidents had breeding plantations in Virginia to supply slaves to, to the Mississippi Delta and other parts of the country as it expanded. So on these breeding plantations, you would have what was considered bucks, which is a, a word that is also used a lot for black men within the porn industry, who would be expected to impregnate a certain amount of girls because these were all young people. Because remember, we didn't live that long on the plantation. Mm -hmm. So boys before a certain age and girls before a certain age were expected to have a certain amount of children before they reached like 14, 15 years old. If they didn't, some of the boys would get castrated. Uh, some of the girls would be experimented on, which is how we get minor, modern gynecology. And they were tortured. So the idea of like, for example, within the porn industry, you will see white men with a complete array of sizes, shapes, and stamina of dicks. Mm -hmm. But black men, if you're not of a certain size, people get turned away all the time because the stereotype is a black man is supposed to have a big dick. Mm -hmm. Across the entire race of black folk, there's all types of dicks. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But because of the way we were sold and commodified in this country, you know, when a white man would look to go purchase a black man at the auction block, one of the things that they would do besides checking our mouths and do all these other things as if we were chattel, they would look and try to find big penises because they thought that person has a more likely ability to impregnate more people. Right. So they get it in their head now. If you're, if, and, and this is just kind of like one of those examples of how racism affects the racist as well as the person that they are racist against. Mm -hmm. If you're out there looking for big black dicks all day <laughs> and that's what you're trying to find and pick, then it's going to make you feel some kind of way about yourself, mm -hmm. regardless of what your own dick size is. You know what I'm saying? And then if you think in the industry and this practice has changed a little bit, but there used to be a lot of white women who would charge a higher fee to be with black men. Yeah, the interracial and, rate. And that actually wouldn't have anything to do with that man's size because you might have fucked a white man or a Spanish dude or, or Asian person with a bigger dick. Mm -hmm. But because he was black, you charge him more because you feel like you're going to be soiled or sullied. You know what I'm saying? It's like getting the the... What is that? The uh, scarlet letter yeah. for for being with a black person. And that shit is so fucked up <laughs> when yeah. you think about it. And people are supposed to be turned on by that. You know what I'm saying? It's still that same kind of power dynamic that is not allowing people to actually be free and loving and passionate and explore their sexuality in all of the ways that we would like adult entertainment to be. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, there are also some women would argue, you know, if they wouldn't do I IR, you know, shortened term for it is, oh, well, it's not me, but like I'll lose fans. You know, that was an argument that I would hear a lot. So your fans are racists. <laughs> <That's laughs> I mean, pretty much. Saying. Yeah. <laughs> I have a really big racist fan base that I need yeah. to please. You know what I'm yeah. saying? I, I think and it's. It's fucked up because it's like we're going through like we we live in Florida right now and we're we're going through a time where actual factual American history is being removed from school books and removed from curriculum and removed from the national conversation because of white racist backlash. 
and primarily white male racist backlash because we are seeing laws that are also targeting women of all colors, trans folk of all colors, you know? So, but like when we talk about what's happening with, with history and education, like Ron DeSantis is like on this crusade against CRT and woke and has absolutely no idea what the fuck woke means. But the reason that he's doing that is because, yo, American history is fucked up. It really is. But if you want to move forward and, and actually fulfill the tenets of what America says that it's about, we have to deal with this shit. We have to deal with the racism, the sexism, the classism. Like, if you want to make a better society for all of humanity, you can't just sweep shit under the rug and pretend it didn't happen. Yeah. And I feel like understanding the history, I mean, even, you know, what you were just talking about going back to, you know, our our slavery um, and our past, I think helping to understand why you might have these ingrained racist I- ideologies that you don't even recognize uh-huh. because it's so indoctrinated in you, it's really helpful to hear about where that comes from because I think that helps us, like, recognize that and then try to remove that or at least help teach our children no, you said, like I, not to think that way as well you know like yeah. at least at the next generation we can try to teach them better yeah that's something no what you said got me so hyped because that's that's literally it like if you look at the like the past is what makes the present like you don't have any now if there wasn't then right yeah so every single stereotype about black people in America comes from slavery because white people had to justify keeping someone as a slave, whipping them, beating them, which is like killing them. So insane to me. It's insane. It's, it's just some, like when these conversations come up, I mean, obviously like as a white woman, I'm just like, <laughs> yeah, but like it's, it's just It's one of those crazy. ones that, that has to happen because for example, what, what I just said about the expectation of children to be forced to have babies. Mm -hmm. Like that's, this is non-consensual at all. It's the least possible way of of consent. Like you're forcing people, right? Mm -hmm. And also raping people. Mm -hmm. One of those those big, big uh, stereotypes is like, you know, all, all black kids get pregnant at this age, black girls get pregnant at this age. No, it happens pretty much consistent across all classes Mm -hmm. in the same way, right? But this one sticks because you have to, at some point, if you're gonna force children to do that, you have to justify it somehow. Mm. You know, same kind of thing. Black women, right now, if if you look at a lot what's coming out about how black women are treated medically as if black women don't feel, well, black people in general, but black women specifically don't feel pain the same way that white women do. So they are not given certain medical attention or even believed by doctors the same way that white women are believed or or given attention by doctors. And that goes back to really just being raped and tortured on the plantation. The same kind of person, and, and when we get back to the porn aspect, you know, the idea that and this goes for Latin women too, like the hot, uh, spicy, and unsatisfiable. Because if you're raping someone every fucking day, you have to create this this idea in your head in order to do so. That she wants it. Yeah. And I think it's the same kind of thing when you think about stereotypes in regards to white women. And like I even think of this when I when I see Karen's going crazy, right? <laughs> White men, in order to justify what they were doing to black women, had to lie and tell white women, like, you know, you're on this pedestal and no one should touch you and no one should ever bother you. You know what I'm saying? So when (laughs) you move to the present and somebody talks to somebody like, no, you're actually wrong here. Like, how the fuck are you talking to me when I'm on my pedestal? Mm -hmm. Right. So you see that play out. And then also the idea, and this goes back to Birth of a Nation, America's considered, what's considered to be America's first great film Mm -hmm. by, uh, what's that, D.W. Griffin. It was all about reconstruction in the South and the heroes were the Ku Klux Klan 
And the bad guys were basically, they were saying like black men were out there attacking white women in the streets mm -hmm. during reconstruction. And that's kind of like that idea of like black men are always like what happened with the Central Park Five. Black men are always after white women. Same kind of thing. White men are like, I'm really scared that all the things that I've done, raping black men, raping black women, raping black babies is going to come back to haunt me mm -hmm. by somebody doing the same thing to me and my family. Mm. So it's just been ingrained in, in people's minds. Yeah. Yeah. All people of all races do fucked up shit. All people of all races are great as well. Like there's there's all people. It's the same. Yeah. It's just about removing like race. Mm -hmm. from that conversation right so that we can say all people are this and all people are also this i mean when it comes to things like that i don't think that there's a race of people who commit crimes more than others <laughs> you yeah. know what i'm saying yeah, like i don't in yeah, that yeah. in that way yeah but i think the conversation of race has to happen in america mm -hmm. and it makes people really uncomfortable but like for white folk who are like ah it's like i don't know it's it's a privilege to be able to be like, ah, I don't know, but I if I want to have this, because we are still dealing with racism in America affecting people of color and even in our industry, still yeah. still dealing with it. Yeah, like the so you're saying like the choice to have a conversation about race, you know, could be is a privilege for white people, but for black people it's, it's necessary because it's something that you deal with. Yeah, we don't even every day. We don't even have a choice. Right. Yeah, it's like um I, I, I see it because like how, how you say like you see these conversations on Twitter and I always see someone like you make everything about race like we we didn't make it that way <laughs> it just is yeah, unfortunately yeah, yeah. yeah you know what I'm saying we didn't choose this shit yeah you know it, and, and it's something I would love to it, it's a utopia to mm -hmm. be able to get past it mm -hmm. but we have to work to get past it it doesn't yeah. just happen out of nowhere yeah you gotta have some uncomfortable conversations yeah just like the same one about men like to get past toxic masculinity yeah. men we have to have some un uncomfortable conversations and it is a privilege to be able to be like i ain't trying to talk about that shit don't fit <laughs> in my man box <laughs> so there has been some changes in the adult industry that we've seen happen since like the black lives matter movement um how do you feel about those changes and like how much do you feel that that we're moving forward? I know we're not like at a point yet where I think anybody can say like, okay, the porn industry isn't racist anymore. <laughs> but do you think that we're we're moving in the right direction? I see individuals who are definitely moving in the right direction. Uh, the industry is like any other. I mean, it's not really. It's. I, I liken it to like a bureaucracy where it's like we want change and everybody wants change, but that should just move slow as hell because mm -hmm. it's a big entity, mm -hmm. you know? Um, I do think there are some companies as well who have really worked to change how they present things. And there are some who definitely, what's that? Virtue signaled during the, during the thing, but they ain't mean that shit. And now that it's, not as prominent and there's a pushback from the i guess from the right where they're like oh man we made our content too woke we gotta <laughs> we gotta get some racism back in here or whatever right <laughs> you know like i i have seen some companies kind of kind of fall back on that mm -hmm. so you know i think some of that shit was people were like i don't know what's about to happen and this this is in mainstream too i don't know what's about to happen so let me let me make sure i'm on the on the side of not being uh, against people being murdered in the street by the police. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but then they're like, later on, they're like, ah, all right, people ain't thinking about that no more. I could go back to business as usual. Mm -hmm. But I, I do see um, a lot of individuals and content creators who have been like, you know what? I don't need to tag interracial yeah. on my shit. Like, it's, it's pretty clear who's in this yeah. video. <laughs> yeah. Well, and also, too, I mean, it goes to that conversation as well that – in porn, interracial only means black man. a black man yeah. and a white woman. It doesn't actually doesn't even mean like um, a black woman and a white man, or an Asian man and a white woman, or a Hispanic man and a white woman. Or like it specifically only means and that, that thing. And that shit sold, which tells you there is still this thing in the psyche of whether this is a taboo thing or 
wherever that fantasy lies at. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. That is still just a little off. Yeah. You know, because if we were to hook up or something like that, hopefully it's on either the content of our our character or Mm -hmm. the attraction or whatever to make a good scene. Yeah. But if it's just like this black dude, it's going to be dirty. (laughs) Yeah. It's crazy to me. Yeah. I mean, how do you feel about the people who argue that, oh, well, if you take out the term interracial, then how am I going to find, I really like to see black men with white women. And that's something that I enjoy. Um, why are you going to take that, that term away? I won't be able to find that kind of content. There is no way you will not be able to find that kind of content. <laughs> like it stopped. <laughs> it's so produced. Mm-hmm. It's so out there. If you go to Pornhub or X videos or any of these joints, you will find that shit. Mm-hmm. Because if you've watched at least one, you know the performer that you just saw. So you could just look up that performer again and yeah. find their other shit. It's yeah. not really that hard. Yeah. Like all of a sudden people act like finding your porn is putting together some kind of theory or something like that. Yeah. It's, it's well, like- and then there's also, I mean, you know, there's companies that specifically shoot pretty much only that yeah i mean i think for companies that shoot that they need to re-examine how they define themselves and the content that they shoot and why they're even doing it yeah personally you know we know why they were doing it well then some of those companies (laughs) well the money but also it's like yeah there's there's a reason for that but how you present Mm -hmm. how you present this content like how the words that you use, like blacked, for example, mm-hmm. is an example of scarlet letter. Like mm-hmm. to say someone was blacked is crazy. Mm-hmm. You know, um, I know in certain situations, performers will say like, I can't shoot content or we can't release content until after I do for this company because it's supposed to be my first scene with a black guy. Mm-hmm. That shit is weird. Yeah. And the fact that like it was put, I mean, at least up until like recently where we've seen it change a little bit, but you know, I've been in the industry for a long time and doing your first IR was on the same level as doing your first anal, doing your first gangbang, doing your first, like, you know, these, these sexual acts that were kind of above and beyond and would take like a certain toll on your body and, and whatnot. So, you know, it made sense that you would wait and try to get, you know, more money for it or whatnot. But the fact that like, oh, I'm going to have sex with this certain kind of person is the same as. Yeah. One thing is, and, and that's where it becomes, we're not human. Yeah. If that's making us the fetish or the sexual act instead of a person. Yeah. It's still a person end of the day. And I think that there's certain, there's certain terms and certain words that we use within the industry that we can we can move on from. Mm-hmm. You know, there's certain words and terminology in the in the lexicon of, of of everyday English that we don't use anymore. I'm not like yo top of the morning to you when I when I got hit. Mm-hmm. So we we can evolve the language and mm-hmm. and evolve to a place where like you can still make dope, beautiful, sexy, passionate, kinky, hardcore content without belittling a race of people. Yeah. You know, and I and I also think and this is a little off topic, but I think we also should be at the point where we don't refer to content as boy girl content anymore hmm. because we're adults and we definitely have people who are coming to try and end our industry as a whole. Like, don't think that it's just stopping at abortion. The people who are pushing to end abortion in America are also going to push to end contraception. They're going to push to end uh, porn as we know it, if completely. Right. So we should also be preparing ourselves within our industry to be able to justify things that we say and do to people who don't believe we should do it at all, because Mm -hmm. there's going to time where we're going to have to do it in court. Yeah. So referring to two adults as boy and a girl, not a good idea, because these people are trying to say that we're pushing something that is not adult. Mm -hmm. Right. Or pushing it to people who are not adults. Yeah. So. We should be fixing shit like that within our industry so that we can have legs to stand on when this this is going to go to court at some point. I mean, in in that vein, what do you think about like the teen genre? Personally, not my bag. Mm-hmm. Personally, 
Um, and, you know, we have a legal situation where it's like at this age, you are able to do it. I myself got started at 18. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So I don't knock people. I know what it's like to be in this for survival and to be able to provide a roof over my head and, and food in my stomach. You know what I'm saying? So I don't knock it. I do think it is very odd to specifically push someone's age like that. You mm-hmm. know what I'm saying? Like to me, that's just not a not a thing. Yeah. Yeah. It's um it's it's not a genre I've ever been a fan of, but it's also like kind of one of those things, well, it's between consensual adults oh, and yeah. you know it's a slippery slope when you start saying well this kind of content's okay but that kind of content isn't okay when it's legal yeah i don't it's, know it's i mean it's funny because it's, it's like there's a lot of things with with age within our yeah. industry that always pop up for me you know what i'm saying it's like you're only a milf if you've given birth to a yeah. child or, no. or have a child with yeah. adopted whatever yeah. if you're a mom you're a milf if yeah. you're not a mom you're not a milf yeah. And it's okay to be whatever age, you know what I'm saying, as an adult making porn. If you getting into shit at 70 and you don't got no grandkids, you're not a gilf. You're just a hot 70-year-old, yo. <laughs> like, <laughs> but it kind of goes back to that need for us to, like, stereotype people exactly. in porn in order to sell it, right? Yeah. And it's, and I do, personally, I don't think you need to stereotype anybody to sell it. I do understand that we have to be able to describe it. And most people have a limited way of describing sex, period, because mm-hmm. either they're not, they don't view sex as a beautiful thing. They're seeing it as a, I'm making money off of this thing. So mm-hmm. I don't, so all the people in it, I don't really give a fuck. You yeah. know, there's a lot of people who are just in it like, this is how I make money. Mm-hmm. There are also a lot of people, unfortunately, well, specifically men, there are a lot of men in this industry who don't give a shit about women, don't like women, don't love women, just want to fuck women. Mm-hmm. So they're going to describe it from a certain kind of angle also, where it's like kind of taking the humanity, well, taking the humanity out of women, you know, within the industry as well. And like, to me, that's, that's why we have Royal Fetish Films and some other companies out there that are doing it differently, that are showing like, you can make money, you can sell it, you can have all kinds of crazy, wild, kinky shit and, and do all the different things without removing people's humanity without belittling people without putting people in situations that they are not comfortable with Mm -hmm. without you know demeaning people Mm -hmm. and people can get their money and have a good time and make great content i also feel like sometimes that people who are watching porn because there is so much shame around it they need to objectify the people that they're watching to maybe feel that they're less human so that they have less guilt around like pleasing themselves to to them. Do you know what I'm saying? Like I you see that, that so often with yeah. the way that fans, you know, attack their favorite porn star and you know what I mean? Like yeah. the person that they watch the most and, and call them a whore and you know, all this kind of stuff, but they're also like a, obsessed with porn, Yeah, you know? So it's like, okay, well let me put this person in this box and let me, you know, stereotype this person as like, somebody who's less than human and then like I don't feel so bad about masturbating to them because I have so much shame around sex and masturbation and I don't want to masturbate to somebody who I see as like a real human being because then I have to think about my views on sex. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think that's like one of those time-tested sex work situations because people do the same when it comes to, um, you know, sex workers in, in all the different genres. Like, I've I've been on cam shows and I'm like, what the fuck are you talking? Why are you saying this right now? Why, mm-hmm. You paid to get on here to say this to somebody? That's, that's <laughs> wild. Yeah, you know. So like, um, or or even you know, people who justify how they how they te- how they treat in in person providers as well. Mm. So I, I think there is like that moment too. Like people are into into certain things and then you know you bust that nut or whatever and you come back to reality. You're like, oh my God, what what am I into? Why did I get turned on by that? Mm-hmm. You might have watched something you never thought you would watch because mm-hmm. you know you go down the rabbit hole or something, <laughs> yeah. you wind up in some wild spots. <laughs> so then it's like, oh man, how do I feel about this? And then yeah, they they get angry, mm-hmm. they get seriously angry because like, why was I turned on by this person? And it's one of those things where it's like, as a society, it'd be great to be able to 
to to change that. Mm -hmm. And I think that porn folk, we have that opportunity to do so. I think now in the age of social media, you know, you have a lot of performers who give you more of themselves than you would back in the day when they when you didn't have to fill up content on Instagram or TikTok or share your thoughts on Twitter or whatever. So now there are there are certain performers out there where I feel like they have fan bases who have followed them into different walks of life or appreciate them for their other skills, talents, and abilities. Like I got fans who who fuck with my music, mm -hmm. you know, and I know there's some other um, performers who make music that have like their fans watch them in both spaces or they're just like, I know that you do that. That shit is cool, you know? Mm -hmm. And the more humanity we allow our fans to see, it also allows them to be like, oh yeah, I'm into some kinky shit. I'm human. This person isn't yeah. too different than me. Yeah, and and that's okay. Yeah. So speaking of uh, your music, um, tell us about that. Tell us about what kind of music are you making? Um, when did you start getting into music? Oh man, I've been making music since I was like yay high. Mm -hmm. I've I've always been into music. Uh, I haven't played instruments as much as when I was younger. So I do production and and I write and perform. You know, hip hop, R and B, all that good stuff. So I've started making music to go along with the scenes that we do. Mm -hmm. I, I recently released a scene uh, that they debuted, they debuted on uh, on Pornhub with uh, Faye Laveau. We actually wrote a song together, filmed us writing the song together. So like it's like in real time, really sitting there writing a song. And she had come up with this chorus and she's singing like, when we going to fuck, right? And then she was like, no, 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 I'm really asking you like, when we going to fuck? And then we have like a whole whole scene or oh, whatever cool. and then we released the song it's called fly me to you and it's it's i love i love music like music is my passion so being able to mix it with with porn is just like my two favorite creative outlets being yeah. able to come together and we all know that porn has some really like terrible oh, music <laughs> It is. That's why I tell any whenever um, I know other people who other performers will be like, yo, can I use your song for my cam show or can I throw it in a scene? I'm like, as long as you let me know you're doing it, yeah. I will. I say yes and I promote it for you. Because I will say like when I have tried to find music to go along with scenes that I've shot, so many of these royalty free websites specifically have a clause. You got to look for it. Like not, you can't use this for porn. Mm. So it can be really hard yeah. to find music that's okay for porn. Yeah. You don't want to get, get, uh, get sued by like ASCAP or BMI out here. Yeah. That's, that's for serious. Yeah. 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 No, definitely <laughs> not. It just makes me actually, it, it makes me laugh because I think about, I mean, I think we can all agree that like most porn movies made back in the eighties had some pretty terrible soundtracks and, <laughs> One of the movies that my parents made, my dad wrote the song for, Stud Hunters. It's terrible. It's so bad. Like the song goes like, Stud Hunters looking for some hardcore loving. It's so terrible. <laughs> and my brother and I used to like, I forget why we, my brother worked for, for my parents for like the smallest amount of time. Mm -hmm. I've worked for them for years. And uh, we used to like sing that song to each other because it was just so bad. Now I'm gonna have it to look so it up. Bad. Is it is it on uh, iTunes? Uh, no, <laughs> <laughs> no. You gotta upload it to iTunes no, or Spotify it's... so you can, you know, get some royalties off of that. I mean, you know, I guess in we do honor. own the rights to it because my honor. my dad did write it. That's so <laughs> terrible. You know, I'll find it because I'm pretty sure the scene is on Sue's net. Um, I'll I'll find it and I'll I'll send it to you. It's it's pretty now, now it's pretty it. bad. No. Maybe you can do like a remix or something. <laughs> <laughs> get, get, get my DJ to cut it up or something. <laughs> uh, you just uh, put out a new album, and proceeds are going to charities in West Africa. Is that right? Oh, it's it's not new. I have released it uh, a while ago. It was called uh, "Music Is My Weapon," and we actually built a school, a freshwater well, and a medical clinic, and put solar panels on the medical clinic. Wow! Um, off of the sales of that of sales of that album. That's and, incredible. Uh, a small village in Guinea-Bissau, West Africa, called Dejati. Wow. And I'm assuming you've been there? I have. I was actually one of, I think actually, no, I was the first American performer to to perform there. 
And it started because there's a hip hop group there called the Baloberos Crew. Mm -hmm. And they had been talking out about the government because the government, it's a narco state. They, the, the head of like their Navy was very high on America's terrorism watch list and drug trafficking tra um, list and all that. So they made a song talking about this shit and they got arrested and detained for a very long period of time. And some people that I know have reached out to me like, would you be down to translate their lyrics from, it's like a Portuguese patois, mm -hmm. which I don't, I don't speak Portuguese patois. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I had to find some people in my neighborhood who did. And we translated the song. So I did their song in English and then added a verse to it and performed it in Brooklyn. And then uh, people were like, yo, we have the opportunity to be able to fly you out there to perform with them. So we did this show and the whole time we thought we were going to get like shut down by military police but we lucked out that there was a failed coup i think that's the only time i've ever been able to say i lucked out because of a failed coup but so like nobody <laughs> shut down the show and we got to rock and it was an amazing night it was probably the one of the best uh performances i've ever done but also being a part of it was one of the most other than the birth of my kids, one of the best things I've ever been a part of. That's incredible. Really amazing. Thank you. Well, King, thank you so much for coming on. Thank um, you for having this has me. been really interesting, educational, like everything. You you fulfilled everything that I expected. <laughs> you know, being the partner of Jasmine. Oh, she set ja the bar Jasmine high. Set that high but bar. I can I can see. I can see why, you know, you two are together. Uh -huh, thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you, you for having me on. Of course, of course. Um, can you tell everyone where they can find you on social media? Yes, yes. At King Noir on Twitter, K I N G N O I R E. At King Noir X on Instagram, at The Real King Noir on TikTok. Uh, but definitely search for me on all of wherever you get your, your music from, you know, Spotify, iTunes, Tidal, all in places. Just throwing King Noir and then royalfetishxxx.com. Fantastic. Thank you. And then you guys can find me on Instagram at Holly Randall. Same on Twitter. I'll go to hollylinks.com for links to all of my platforms. And of course, if you want to support this podcast, go to patreon.com slash Holly Randall Unfiltered. Thank you guys so much for coming and I will see you next week. <laughs> <laughs>